Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the London School of Economics. My name is Silvana Tanreiro. I'm a professor of economics. I'm a member of the Center for Macroeconomics here at the LSE. And I'm very pleased to be here today to welcome Richard Doves, Jonathan Woodsell, and Stephanie Flanders. Authors Richard Doves and Jonathan Woodsell will be introducing their new book, No Ordinary Disruption and Stephanie Flanders will be their discussant. Um, let me say a few words about the speakers. Uh, Richard Doves is director of the McKinsey Global Institute, which is McKinsey and Company's economics and business research arm, and he's a se senior partner at McKinsey. He joined McKinsey in 1988, and from 2008 to 2009, he co-led its corporate finance practice. From 2009, Richard has co-directed McKinsey Global Institute, first from South Korea and then from London, where he's currently based. He is a co-author of Value, the Four Cornerstones of Corporate Finance, and his work has appeared in several books, including Korea 2020, Global Perspectives for the Next Decade. His co-author, Jonathan Woodsell, is a director of the McKinsey Global Institute in Shanghai, and he leads McKinsey research on China, Asia, and global economics and business trends. As leader of the firm's Cities Initiative, he has conducted more than 60 projects for governments throughout China, su supporting local economic development and transformation. He also supports the transformation of Chinese companies into global leaders. Responding to Richard and Jonathan will be uh, Stephanie Flanders, who is Managing Director and Chief Market St Strategist for the UK and Europe at JP Morgan Asset Management. Stephanie was previously the econo Economics Direct Editor at the BBC, and prior to this, she worked as a reporter at the New York Times speechwriter and senior advisor to U.S. Treasury Secretaries Robert Rubin and Larry Summers, Financial Times leader, writer, and columnist, and an economist at the Institute for Fiscal Studies and the London Business School. So we're all looking forward to hearing about the book, and I'll make just a few uh, logistical points before we get started. Please put your mobiles on silent right now so that we don't disrupt the event. The talk will be recorded and we hope a podcast of the event will be made available online. For those on Twitter, the hashtag is LSE McKinsey. And the plan is the following. We'll have the author speaking first, um, making uh, highlights about the book. Stephanie will respond to them and after that, the. Um, we will have a Q&A session. There will also be a book signing event after the talk, and finally, copies of the book will be available just outside the theater. Um, for now, please join me in welcoming Richard, uh, our first speaking speaker to, tonight. Thank you. Well, I'm afraid I want to actually start with a little bit of bad news. Bad news for all of you here, whether you be business executives, students, or academics. The bad news is that the intuition that many of you have built up over your lives could get you to the wrong answer in making decisions. And however fact-based you think you are on making a decision, intuition plays a really important role. And the reason that intuition is wrong is we are seeing four large disruptions hitting the global economy. Each of those disruptions are larger than anything we've ever seen, and we have four of them hitting the world economy together, such that our intuition that we've built up about how the world's gonna work going forward, the intuition we use to make family decisions, business decisions, career decisions, may actually get us to the wrong answer. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about this, but this is not a new phenomenon. People have um, had intuition about how the world's worked in the past. Which uh, well-known UK scientist said this? Okay. Well, that was Lord Kelvin. So, you know, he had an intuition about how the scientific world worked. But also, uh, the business world had uh, a pretty good intuition. 
five computers. Well, I have all five in my briefcase, actually, at the moment. Um, do you know who said that? Yeah, that's right, Thomas Watson. No, the, the IBM historian came up and told me it wasn't the case, but I, I'm still sticking with this slide. Um, <laughs> the arts community had a view as well. Who the hell wants to hear actors talk? That was Harry Warner. Um, politicians, too. This one's pretty well known. That's right. She, she's actually unique on this list. As not only was her intuition wrong, she was the one who actually proved her intuition was wrong. Um, and how about the forecasting thing, market? Cell phone penetration in the US, 900,000 in the year 2000. Out by a factor of 100. Yep, that's absolutely right. That was us. So, lots of people went out and forecast the world, and they based their forecast on their intuition they'd grown up with, and they got to the wrong answer as a result. Now, if you think about the period we've all built up our intuition, it's actually been an incredibly benign period for the global economy. If you look at global growth, if you had sort of been living in the year 1700 and thought about global growth, a good growth rate was 0.3%. Tell that to the Eurozone. You know, good growth here, 0.3%. And then we had the Industrial Revolution, and we saw growth rates of going up to about 2%, um, up to the, the Second World War. But what we've seen since the end of the Second World War has been an extraordinary growth period. We've grown between 3 and 5%. And we've been driving growth through two big engines. We've been driving it through demographics, a growing workforce, but we've also been driving it through productivity. So we've had a wonderful growth rate. And implicit in many of the decisions we make about the future is the fact that we've lived in this world of this growth. And we'll come back and talk about why that might not be the case. We've also lived in a world where capital has got progressively cheaper. This chart shows real interest rates, both real and nominal, across the selection of countries. So you can see it fell from about 12, 14% in nominal terms to about four, and in real terms to about two. That has underpinned a lot of the asset price growth. We've had a wonderful period of asset price growth, driven by this falling interest rates. Capital has got progressively cheaper. That asset price growth that we've grown up with, let's say London property, whether, let's say uh, you know, equities, bonds, won't necessarily be sustainable because we're unlikely, despite what the Swiss are trying to do, to have this type of growth going, uh, falling in interest rates going forward. We've also seen, despite the 20-fold increase in, uh, in GDP over the last century, commodities, and this is a basket including food, energy, and raw materials, commodity prices actually halved in real terms. So commodities actually got cheaper despite this growth. And we've seen a wonderful world for business. This chart shows EBITDA, EBIT, no black net income. Both you can see as a percentage of global GDP, but also the absolute numbers at the bottom. You know, EBITDA grew faster than GDP. EBIT grew a bit faster. No plats, net operating profit, less adjusted taxes, where we've adjusted taxes to say, what would you have paid tax-wise if it hadn't been for the tax shield on the debt? grew 29% faster, and for corporations with interest rates dropping, profitability grew 79% faster than GDP. So we've been in a wonderful world for the profit, profitability of the Western corporation. So it's been a pretty easy world we've lived in. And we've borrowed more. We've actually enjoyed the benefit of it. We've benefited from falling interest rates and we've been able to borrow more. This shows uh, the total debt outstanding and debt as a percentage of global GDP. And you can see up to the financial crisis, debt grew. And then we had a financial crisis caused by too much debt. And since the end of that financial crisis, which was caused by too much debt, we borrowed an extra um, 60 billion or 60 trillion rather in terms of uh, debt debt. So we've been able to borrow more despite the fact that you know, we had a financial crisis through pretty much that. So we really enjoyed ourselves. We had a very benign environment. We had uh, interest rates falling, good growth, and we were able to borrow more. Now, this world is being disrupted. It's being disrupted by four disruptions. 
None of these disruptions will be a surprise to anyone in this room. The challenge is the speed and scale at which they're happening. I'm going to hand over to my colleague, co-author Jonathan, who's going to talk through a little bit about some of these disruptions. It's, uh, it's very hard to follow Richard on his home turf. So, uh, so I'm going to talk about China, which is where I live. And uh, we'll talk about these disruptive forces, giving some examples from other parts of the world. I hope they'll also resonate with you. The first is industrialization and urbanization. Now, as Richard said, this is nothing new. Um, we've been seeing urbanization for some time. Uh, today, over half the world lives in urban cities. Uh, we have 65 million every year coming into cities. Uh, sitting in China, I feel like they're all coming to my city uh, at the same time. Uh, but, uh, you know, it is, it is a long-term trend. Now, what we've, uh, why is this happening? This is sort of you know, the world's economic history on a page, uh, economic development versus urbanization. And I think everybody can sort of see the relationship here. Uh, suffice it to say, uh, there are no rich countries which aren't urbanized. Uh, there are urban countries which are not rich, uh, but there are no rich countries which aren't urban. It seems to be a necessary step, uh, a necessary process of specialization, high density, high frequency interactions that enable us to learn, to develop, uh, and to deploy technologies which in turn allow us to become that much more productive. So how big a deal is this? You saw the video. I'm going to just sort of remind people about the numbers. Uh, here, the cradle of uh, Industrial Revolution. Roughly, it took about 150 years to double income during this period of industrialization. And that affected 10 million plus people. That was roughly what happened here back in the 1700s. Uh, the U.S. did it a little bit faster, sort of 50, million, 50 years, in Germany, 60 years, 10 million people, 28 million people. Japan, a little faster. South Korea, a little faster. You see where we're going with this. Uh, so China, 12 years to double income, a billion people. And that's the math. It's about 100 times as fast, oh, sorry, 100 times as large and 10 times as fast. So, a thousand times the impact. And if we extend that to the rest of the emerging markets, you get 3,000 times the impact of the UK Industrial Revolution. That is an asteroid hitting the planet in terms of consumption, in terms of resource requirements, in terms of competition. And that is why we call it a disruption. Now, where is it happening? This is, uh, it's not random. We do observe patterns and clusters. So here we have the, the China map. And as you can see, you know, 46 out of the top 200 cities by 2025 will be Chinese. And uh, a large number of them will be close to where I live in Shanghai. Uh, so we see a pattern of cluster development where there are hubs and spokes. So, but it's not only, of course, China. We see a similar pattern in India, in the Middle East, in Africa. We can look at Africa and see 50 countries, or we can see 30 urban clusters. And the 30 urban clusters is closer to an economic representation of the continent. So what does this mean? Sometimes we're accused of being short term. So take us back 2,000 years. Where was the economic center of the world? Somewhere between India and China, reflecting economic activity and demographics largely. And for 1,500 years, not much changed. We had war, we had plague, we had famine, we had the Crusades, but still, the economic center of the world was between China and India, somewhere there. And then we had the Industrial Revolution. So we move up a little bit, and then all of a sudden, we go left. <laughs> and we keep going left, and we keep going left, all the way out to almost Greenland. <laughs> And that was where we had the, that was the impact of the Industrial Revolution, urbanization, Western Europe, North America. You see the pull. What is happening today? We're making the big round trip. So we're going back to 
Novaya Zemlya, I believe, <laughs> and then somewhere in Siberia, and you ask, where will it all end up? Well, Kazakhstan. <laughs> So our friends in Astana are very excited about this. Uh, the, the, the jog south has to do incidentally with demographics, which you're about to talk about, because that actually reflects urbanizing, industrializing Africa and the Middle East. Uh, what are the implications? This is probably the single most obvious one. We are about to have three billion people more in the consuming classes. And we say that we use that term advisedly as opposed to middle class or affluent class, because these are the class that will actually buy things. They will buy televisions, they will buy cars, they will take trips, because they can, they can afford it, at lower levels of income than their OECD predecessors. This, this poses a conundrum for suppliers to the consumer classes of goods and services that they want, but may not pay the same amount as their predecessors did. How many, people do, how many people are studying piano today in China, do you think? Any, any guesses? How many piano players are there, aspiring piano players? Yeah, somewhere, 50, 70 million. I, do you think they're playing Steinway <laughs> or Yamaha? <laughs> no, they're playing the Pearl River Delta Piano Company's piano. <laughs> it has keys. <laughs> it has a string. It makes noise. But there are 50 million of them. And sooner or later, the suppliers of those pianos are going to figure out how to make a better piano, and ultimately they will have a competitive advantage. So that's the challenge. Three billion more new consumers. First one. Second one, disruptive technologies. The alphabet soup. We see a lot of technologies. How do we know which ones are actually the ones that make a difference? Well, as you might have started to feel like, we're not giving you the answer, but we are telling you what it's likely to look like, or what is the trend. And the one thing we can say is that things are speeding up. First phone call, 1876. First website, 1991, 115 years. First iPhone, 16 years. <laughs> things are going faster. The Internet of Things is with us already today. If we look at robotics, same thing. 200 years from Hargreaves to Unimate, factory automation to 50 years to Shaft to be able to go into a, into a nuclear power station after Fukushima to AI. My favorite is the printing press. It took 400 years from the printing press to the laser printer. It took 30 years from the laser printer to the 3D printer. <laughs> Let, let's see how fast things are going. And it's not just on the invention side. It took uh, approximately 75 years for 50 million people to pick up the phone <laughs> and talk to each other. 75 years. That's quite a long time. Uh, it took 38 years for, people to, uh, for 50 million people to listen to the radio. 13 years for television. Four years for the iPod. Three years for the internet. One year for Facebook. Nine months for Twitter. And the winner, 35 days for Angry Birds. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so you see, the, consumption, the consumer side picking up just as fast as the inventor side. 50 million is no longer a big deal. We could have put Xiaomi there, but people know Angry Birds. <laughs> And it's unfortunately having some externalities. This looks like a, a law professor's office or a, a legal office. That, that's, what it might, that's what it used to look like. Uh, today it sort of looks like that. <laughs> All that paper is being replaced by one person. If that, it's being screened, it's being digested, it's being spit back, it's being organized, it's being automated. So it's not just the cashier at the checkout counter or the teller that is losing their jobs because of technology. It's the journalist down the street. It's the, it's the uh, repairman. Uh, it's, it's whoever it is whose work can be thought of as a series of discrete tasks that could be split up, automated, and, and put back together again. So third one, aging. Something that unfortunately many of us are personally familiar with. <laughs> Does anybody know this building? Yes, I heard it. The China Pavilion. It's, this is the Chinese Pavilion at the Shanghai Expo. This is, a, this is a beautiful pavilion. But no, that is not the right answer. The right answer, this is the Chinese demographic pyramid in the year 2030. <laughs> <laughs> As is illustrated by this chart. So to say, we will have one person, one small child supporting two parents, supporting four grandparents. And that is uh, one of the fastest progressions towards an aging society the world has ever seen. And, uh, why is this happening? Fertility rates have been coming down for a long time. 
This is partly an income function, but it's also education and availability. So, and it's, not clear, it's clearly not linked to ethnicity or anything like that. It's simply a reality that we actually know pretty much what's going to happen on the demographic side. Now, of course, that might be the cue for a great new disruption, <laughs> but this is the way the world looks, and this is what has been happening. What we can also say is that given public health, uh, one out of four people in advanced economies plus China will be over the age of 65 uh, by 2040. So good news for me. <laughs> I have lots of friends then. Um, <laughs> that's an amazing thing. It has some implications though. We think about China as having a billion people in the workforce. Uh, not so fast. Uh, it will actually have 850 million in the workforce by 2050. It's going to lose 150 million people out of the workforce and so on and so forth. So 10, 15, 20 percent declines in what's available. This has a real implication, particularly if you live in a country which has a defined benefit program. A friend of mine said, when faced with this kind of reality, there are three options you have. Work harder, save more, reset your expectations. <laughs> So that is, a, that is a very real consequence of this disruption. Uh, this is what we think. Roughly the global workforce will peak at the, in 2030, or some, some earlier, some sooner, some, sooner, some later. Uh, this take us back to what Richard said before, about half of the world's growth came out of population growth. That 3.6, 4% of growth that we had over the last 50 years, about half of that was from new people coming into the workforce. If that's going to peak, there's nobody new, what's going to happen? Well, we're going to lose half our growth. <laughs> so that's the opportunity question here is can we make up for that demographic decline with increases in productivity, the work harder, work smarter option, we hope, of those first three options I mentioned. So those are the three, first of all, big disruptions. I'm going to pass it back to Richard now to talk about the, the fourth and then some of the implications. Thank you, John. So maybe the, the fourth one of these disruptions is a bit less intuitive. We have connected the world up in ways that we're not used to. I'm going to give you some examples of this. In some ways, the most obvious one is the fact that we've had increasing flows. As you can see, flows growing faster, the percentage of GDP numbers growing effectively doubling as percentage of GDP, financial flows, flows in services. But we can also see the impact of where the flows are working. This shows the world trade in 1990, very much centered around Europe as a hub. But as we can see where the trade has moved, um, in 2013, we're getting a different type of network. We're getting a lot of south-south connection in terms of trade. Trade's happening around different ways. But this is only one example of the connectivity. We've also connected things together that didn't used to be connected. This chart shows the correlation of various commodity prices with oil prices. Corn in the 1980s had very little correlation. There was some, but it wasn't much. That correlation has gone up much higher. We've connected it, food prices and energy prices together because of things like biofuels. If energy prices go up, farmers grow more biofuels, pulls food prices up as well. So we've connected those together. And actually, another example of connectivity is all the stuff we're seeing about Greece at the moment. Now, Greece as a country has actually been in default on their government debt 50% of the time since they became independent from the Turkish Empire or the Ottoman Empire. Now, it didn't matter 20 years ago whether Greece was in default or not. Unless, I mean, obviously, if you were a banker lending to Greece, that may have mattered. But for most of the rest of us, it really didn't matter. We've now connected Greece up to the world economy through the euro. Such an event, and an event that happened 50% of the time, can hardly be described as a black swan event. Such that this non-white, I mean, almost white swan event happens, suddenly we're in a major crisis because we've connected Greece up. Another example is we've connected up systems through the internet. It is now possible for a hacker sitting in a basement in Moscow to take down the electric system in the west coast of the United States because we've connected things that 
meant that we weren't connected. So I think we can see the consequence of some of these connections. Obviously, if you do the maths, as correlation goes up, so does volatility. You can see the number of three sigma days for the stock exchange. We can also see the impact on the world economy. This shows global growth since the 1950s. And we threw some pretty big shocks at the global economy. Oil price shocks, some of the wars we had. And actually, while that may have hit some countries, it didn't hit the global economy. The global economy didn't ever have a recession since the Second World War. But we connected it up, and then we threw a shock, and the Lehman shock was quite a big one, but really, when you do the maths, it was not much bigger than any of the other shocks. But we can see the impact of it. Because the world was more connected, we had our first global recession because of this connectivity. And understanding some of this connectivity is one of our challenges. So what does this mean? Well, I'm going to give you just a few examples of the types of things you need to do on your intuition reset. I want you to just do a quick survey. Has anyone in this room been to Tianjin? So we've got about, you know, 2 3% of the audience has been to Tianjin. It's a city just outside Beijing. Um, Tianjin at the moment currently has a GDP of about $130 billion. Uh, dollars. Put that in context, that is about the same as Stockholm. Has anyone here been to Stockholm? Yeah, okay, so. Um, so he he uh, here is a city that has about the same GDP as Stockholm. Now, Stockholm is one of the fastest growing country, uh, cities in Europe because of demographics and other things. And by 2025, Stockholm, we think, will have a GDP of about 210 billion. Um, Tianjin does even better. 600 billion. In fact, Stockholm no longer is a good comparator. You actually need to compare Stockholm, uh, Tianjin to Sweden. So this city that 2% you know, of you have been to will end up you know, under this scenario by 2025 20, uh, with the same GDP as all of Sweden. Now, for those of you from a corporation, think about who's responsible for growth in, T um, in Stockholm or Sweden. Normally, when you ask an executive, they say, oh, yeah, we know who that is. That's Fred or Joe or whatever. You ask them who's responsible for Tianjin, and they get their map out and look at where Tianjin is. Then they get the file out, and he's five or six levels, if there is someone, five or six levels more junior than the person who's responsible for Sweden. Corporations are resetting their investment very, very slowly. When we look at what actually happens, there's a huge inertia. You invest where you used to be. This is not just an issue for um, our corporations. You look at where the diplomats are. Wuhan will have 10 times the growth of Auckland. You look at the US State Department, they have 10 times more diplomats in Auckland than they have in Wuhan. Wrong way around for where the growth is going to be. They have to also reset their expectations and where they put their people. If you want to play around these numbers, we have a free app called Urban World. You can download it for your, on your iPhone or your, your Samsung Galaxy or whatever and play around with these numbers. We have all the sort of data there to try to help people reset their intuition about cities. So that's the first example of how our expectations about how the world is going to be may be wrong. Second example is the impact on commodity prices, the, the growth we're seeing. Remember, I started with this chart showing how commodity prices have fallen over 100 years. We've seen the impact, despite the fall off recently, we've seen the impact of um, the growth in the terms of the number of consumers. So this fall off that we'd seen as we went from a billion to two billion consumers, we've seen the, the increase in terms of commodity prices. Now, when you talk to politicians about this, they get annoyed that utilities are increasing energy prices. Why are they not cutting the prices? Why are they not worrying about in, uh, some of the investment in insulation? Well, because we've lived in a world where actually commodity prices have historically fallen, but that's not the case going forward. Another example is who are the companies that are going to be competing? Many of us have sort of, you know, a mental model that the large companies in the world come from the developed world. This is actually, you know, a snapshot in 2000. There were only 24 members of the Fortune R500 that came from emerging markets. And that's who we think of as the large corporations in the world. We did some research a few years ago and we came up with a forecast that roughly half of the Fortune 500 by the year 2025 are going to come from emerging markets. And when we came up with that number, some people said, you know, you must be smoking dope to come up with that number. But actually, you can see 
we're already halfway there. By 2014, half, uh, a quarter of the, the 130 of the Fortune 500 were already from emerging markets. And these companies bring a different way of behaving. If I look at the, the types of companies that I worked with when I was in Asia, they have a degree of brutality. They will have two competing R&D centers, and they will put the R&D centers against each other. They will study their competitors, particularly their Western competitors, to a micro level. We would view that in the West as sort of almost not cricket to spend too much time spying on our competitors. We want to be brilliant on our own. We don't want to spend time. They will understand to a micro level and the sources of weakness to go after the competitors. And they will work very hard. We did a piece of strategy where we changed the R&D pipeline for a client. Their R&D people slept four hours a night for six months next to the R&D center to get the new product out to the market. We think our client was able to do it twice as fast as their Western competitor, their best Western competitor, and four times faster than the average competitor through that type of brutality. So the world of competition is going to change. It isn't just Chinese companies, companies from Latin America. Anheuser-Busch was arguably one of the best run beer companies in the world. The Brazilians now running it are running it better. Brazilians running one of the best American beer companies better in terms of behavior. It's going to be a shock. But it's also not just about large corporations. If you were in Thailand and you were to search on Thai Google for a two kilowatt electric motor, the paid site at the top comes up, the old traditional supplier of electric motors. They had a supply chain, they had R&D, and they had the ability to produce these products and sell them into, manufacture them in places like China and deliver them in Thailand through their warehouse. The first free site that comes up on Thai Google is actually Alibaba. And you can click on it and you can see that there's actually a choice of 48,000 different electric, two kilowatt electric motors. Um, and you can click on individual ones, and you can see that they're being manufactured here, you can contact the supplier, you can look at the ratings, you can compare different electric motors. Something remarkable is happening here. A technology Alibaba marketplace is shifting the world such that these small manufacturers in China are able to compete just as effectively with the likes of Siemens. The old economy of scale that Siemens used to have has disappeared. And this isn't just an Asian business. If you look here, the UK government has introduced the G Cloud for all IT services to the UK government. Half of the activities being won now on G Cloud are coming from SMEs. SMEs are able to go in and compete to work for the DVLA to rewrite their website in a way that wasn't possible when you had to go around and call on the different agencies. So we're seeing the shift of balance. We're seeing the shift by the rise of emerging market companies changing competitors, but we're also seeing some of these platforms allowing SMEs to come in and compete in a different way going forward as a result of the disruptions. The workers are going to have a shock too. This chart shows US wages for, for male full-time workers. And as you can see, since 1975 or sort of 1963, the, the, the graduate school workers have generally gone up in terms of salaries. But what is quite interesting is when you look at unskilled, and we're using here a measure of uh, education as a measure of skill. It's not perfect, we know. But since 1975, salaries have actually been in decline in real terms for the male unskilled worker. And that's because of the disruptions coming through, and they've already been coming through. They've been replaced by technology. A lot of them were building cars and things like that. The cars are now being built by robots. They're being displaced by trade, and they're being displaced by migration. So we have a cohort of people who were growing up being paid less than the previous generation. Now, at the time this happened, we didn't notice it. Because women participation marks part of it. And we also had a big asset price boom because of the falling interest rates I talked about earlier. If interest rates can't fall any further, that's going to stop masking it. And the ability to stretch participation is going to become a problem. So we're going to be in a world where there's going to be increasingly a cohort in the developed world that is going to be growing up less well off than the previous generation. And how we deal with that politically is going to be one of the challenges. And that finally brings me to the final sort of political area about how we deal with this. 
And there's a lot spoken today about, you know, the real political leader in Europe, Angela Merkel. And everyone talks about all the structural reforms that Germany's done and why aren't the Greeks doing those structural reforms, why aren't the French, why aren't you, et cetera, et cetera. We know the story. But of course, the challenge is it wasn't Angela Merkel that did those structural reforms. Those structural reforms were done by him. And when he came to his election to get re-elected, he lost to her. So I think we have a challenge in terms of dealing with these, structures in our, uh, these disruptions in our political system of how we manage to avoid the Schroeder problem. Or as Juncker said, you know, we all know what we need to do, we just don't know how to do it and get re-elected afterwards. <laughs> so hopefully I haven't depressed you too much about the world. What are the leadership attributes we're going to need going forward? Well, we think there are three. First one is external focus. You need to understand some of the changes that are happening outside and need to be able to understand what that means. Now, for those of you who may need a heart transplant, you need to listen quite carefully for the next few minutes. The Google driverless car is going to be a great invention. It has been a great invention. It is now driven around uh, uh, close to well, 700,000 miles without actually um, having any accident. As this rolls, sorry, there was one accident, someone drove into the back of them. Uh, hmm? Okay. So, someone drove into the back of them. Anyway, it's been a great success. The consequence of this car as it rolls out is that we're going to have many fewer road accidents. Now, you need to understand this, and if you need a heart transplant or if you're a heart surgeon, you need to understand the consequences of this because... The second order effect of this effect, uh, driverless car is there'll be fewer accidents. The third order effect is the traditional source of hearts for transplants will disappear. Now, maybe we'll be able to 3D print them in time. So, first attribute of leaders is they look outside, understand the world's changing, understand what this means for their organization. And I am amazed how inwardly focused many large corporations still are. People have spent time understanding their internal politics and manoeuvring this and getting change to happen in their company, and that's been a big area of distinctiveness. We think the challenge going forward is to be externally focused. The second attribute of winners is going to be agile, to be able to respond. An example of this agility is the Indian space program. Now, many I didn't know India had a space program, but they do. They've successfully put an orbit around Mars, but what is most staggering is they, the price they did that for. India put an orbiter around Mars, and they were the first space program to get their first orbiter to work first time. They did it for $75 million. <coughs> Put that in context, the film Gravity cost $80 million to make. <laughs> so the Indians were able to get a real orbiter going around Mars for less than the uh, cost of the film Gravity. And the last time the US uh, government space program bought an orbiter, they bought it and it cost 750 million. So the second attribute is going to be agility and low cost ability to sort of take ideas from different places and assemble them. And then the third attribute of the winners is how we view all this change. It is very easy to say we're in a world where computers are going to be replacing our jobs. We're going to see the rise of the machine. You could even get further and say artificial intelligence. You know, you can get into a world of Terminator where artificial intelligence is going to go and start trying to killing humans. Um, you get a world where you talk about all the environmental problems, you talk about government deficits, you grow, talk about a group of people that are poor on their parents, etc. You can paint a very pessimistic view of the world. But you could also take a different view of the world. You could say this is a world where we'll be able to have tailored drugs to our genome that comes after cancer. It's a world where we've already taken a billion people out of poverty through urbanisation. It's a world where you in your house are able to search anything that has ever been written and find stuff. It's a world where we actually have the ability to sell to 4 billion consumers rather than 1 billion. We think the winners are going to be the ones who actually see this as the positive world, and see the opportunities. It's going to be disproportionately the optimists who are going to win. So the three attributes of winners, external focused, be able to understand how the world's changed and bring it into their company, their family. Secondly, agile, low cost, be able to do that. And finally, optimism, to be able to realise that there are opportunities being created and we should be going after them rather than to, to struggle to try and retain the world we used to grow up in. Thank you.
そのとり。I was reminded about what I really like. Well, two things that go together that I really like about the McKinsey Global Institute's、uh, work. And it's that they start with the data and they turn the data into really cool charts. <laughs> and those of us who are always looking for cool charts to nick, I mean to take and then attribute the very small writing at the bottom,、um, <laughs> the, uh, the MGI has always been a very good、uh, source for these things. In fact, I noticed I was saying to Richard as I left, I was looking for one of the reports that this book is based on as I was leaving my house. And I have very few things that I have kept in hard copy because,、uh, of course, we are all in our paperless studies and our. I had to move all the stuff from the BBC and all that stuff. And、um, of, the hand, of the not very many external sort of reports and things that I had kept and thought were worthwhile having in my bookshelf, about a depressing number, about half a dozen were McKinsey、uh, reports. And those of you who might have noticed, in fact, even my boss, Jamie Dimon at JP Morgan, he so much likes the McKinsey Global Institute, he's decided to buy his own. Uh, he's very recently created an institute which really bears quite a lot of similarity to the、uh, McKinsey Global Institute and has hired to run it someone who used to run the McKinsey Global Institute. So,、uh, um, but just to kick off some、uh, things that、uh, was struck me about the report when I was reading it, and I had read bef- at least bits of some of the reports it's based on. Um, you can get into an argument about is this period really so special? Don't we always think that our time is special? I've decided that's kind of a silly argument. I mean, historians can have that argument, but we know, we all know, that there's something very special about this time. It's the only time that we get to live in.、Um, so I think the fact, it doesn't really matter whether historians are going to say, you know what, it was slightly more disruptive when the electricity was coming in in the 19th century, or this, that, and the other. It feels like there are a lot of things coming together, and it's what we're living with. We're not living in the 19th century and we're not living in the 22nd century, so it seems I'm quite happy with it, thinking of it as the most special time that we need to handle.、Um, is it very important to recognise and understand this stuff with as much data as you possibly can? Absolutely, and I think that's what's so great about、um, these reports. I think. Bringing the data to bear, I remember one of the earlier reports that the Institute did,、um, which is not in this book, but about how could we meet the environmental challenges. Well, you refer to it in the book a bit.、Uh, just the, just the, the, sim- the simple fact of bringing together all the global data and thinking through global best practice and what the implications would be of just applying that best practice, let alone doing any other exciting innovation, how far that. Helped you solve the problem, I think, was a really useful contribution, which you've now made in a lot of other areas.、Um, you know, you look at、uh, variation in anything, whether it's health outcomes or productivity or this, and you can say, what would happen if we just limited, eliminated the worst of that and got everyone up to best practice? How much would we gain? And I think, you know, that is really helpful, and the way that You bring together the data on productivity. You know, as an economist, of course, I never really stop thinking about productivity at the moment. It's the most important、um, factor driving real living standards and income. And you know, the Paul Krugman thing in the productivity is not everything,、um, but in the long run, it's pretty much everything. And I think one factor, you didn't say it directly, but you had it in some of your opening charts. The idea that even if we just manage to maintain the productivity growth we've had over the last 50 years、uh, is still going to mean much slower growth for the world、um, because of the lower labour force growth, I think is a really important one for people to get their heads around. And in fact, we think we're dealing with a time when productivity growth is going to be lower as well. I mean, the ability to make more stuff with the same number of people is going to be lower, and we're also going to get less growth in the number of people. Um, just focusing people's minds on that, I think, is, is really helpful. I also thought I was really interested in the way that you brought that growth discussion into the conversation about the cost of capital. Now I'm sitting in the sort of asset management side of the world.、Um, I'm looking in a slightly different way at this question of interest rates, which, of course, was obs- everyone's obsession 
when I was at uh, the BBC as well. In fact, I used to have all my colleagues used to ask me, people I didn't think really understood economics would come up to me and ask me very complicated things about, if you, do you think if the, if the Chinese central bank responds unexpectedly to this, that and the other, will that mean that... A, and I would think about the question for a minute and then I would ask them, are you about to get a new mortgage? <laughs> <laughs> and really every question I was asked was usually because someone was facing the decision whether to get a variable or a fixed rate mortgage and they wanted to know whether rates were going to go up or not. But as you say, the story of the last quite a long time has been of falling rates, even when we weren't expecting them to. And I think almost a source of solace for some of us maybe has been the idea that this slower growth and low interest rates would were kind of going together. So once we got to the higher interest rates and we had to maybe worry a bit more about the price of our house or the cost of our mortgage, we would also be in a world where the economy was growing faster and things would be better from that, even if we were paying more for our mortgage. And I, what was kind of disturbing about, I'm not sure I completely agree with it, but what was interesting about your chapter on this is you actually posed the possibility that we could have the cost of capital go up, but actually that not go with faster growth in the developed world, and we might, at least in the developed world, and we might be then dealing with that as a real dilemma, that things get worse on both you know, things become more harder to finance and we have less growth uh, as well. So I thought that was uh, interesting. You know, of course, I would say, do, Mac do McKinsey have all the answers? You know, I think, luckily, I think I'd say you don't. Uh, so it gives something else for the rest of us to do. I think there's a specific thing which maybe is a sort of tension in the report, which is, as I said, you, you, the absolute classic, if you don't mind me saying so, McKinsey report is, here's lots of numbers, and then here's all the variation, and then here's what you can gain from getting back to best practice. If the world is changing so blooming fast, yeah. I'm not sure even you know what best yeah, practice okay. is. And that, I wondered a bit about that because you were sort of citing some of the quite traditional recipes for improving productivity or improving growth, yeah. which may or may not still apply in this very yeah. fast-changing world. So I was noticed, for example, buried in the small print of an IMF World Economic Outlook, which I know you all queue up to get the latest IMF World Economic Outlook, but they actually had some rather interesting analysis of the impact. They looked at productivity, looked at how growth was being affected um, by long-term factors and by the crisis, and then they looked at how much you could improve total factor productivity, so the efficiency with which you use inputs, doing various things like the standard recipe, for example, labour market flexibility. Uh, and they found that actually labor market, increasing labour market flexibility didn't improve total factor productivity at all. And I thought, given that they've been telling, and indeed the OECD and everyone else has been telling governments to do this ad nauseam for 20 years, that was a major conclusion to have in box 25.2 of chapter 8 of the World Economic Outlook. But they, and there were other things which you also mentioned in your report which did, acti did actually help increase productivity, um, making, service, uh, making the service sector more flexible, actually doing things which, is quite, which are quite hard, which irritate a lot of big companies. Mm. That actually had more of an impact than these things we tend to talk about when we talk about structural reforms, when we tell the Greeks to do structural reforms. We're telling them usually to get rid of labour market regulations, make it easier to hire and fire people. But the message of that research and some of this other research is that doesn't really help you very much. Actually, you need to do more of this increase in competition and things like that. So I guess that's an example where the best practice, what we were told was best practice 15 or 20 years ago, has not changed very quickly in response to the evidence. Mm -hmm. And we're still sort of piling out these prescriptions saying, do this, do that. And actually, we don't know necessarily whether it works. I mean, for me, um, you know, I'm not going to say a lot more about this, but I think, on, again, on this question of productivity, the experience of the last few years has thrown up a real uh, conundrum about how do you best maximise your growth over the long term? How do you preserve your human capital and your productivity? You know, the US and the UK, on paper, both very flexible labour markets. They did all the same... Labour market, well, the US was always quite flexible, but we had all of our reforms, all the things that now Greece is being told to do, we did in the 80s and 90s. That seems to have, in the response to a similar shock, flexibility in the US meant loads of people got fired. In fact, more than you would expect, given the fall in the economy. Flexibility in the UK 
actually meant real wages fell and we had actually very strong employment growth over the course of this cycle, much stronger than we expected. What's happened then is we've had a lot more people employed. We haven't been producing that much stuff. Our productivity has tanked. So we've done appallingly on your productivity measure, but we've kept all these people in work. And is that possibly better in the long term for our growth and our productivity that we've kept people in work? And if it is better, what does that say about what companies should be doing and what government should be doing? It's, it's some kinds of flexibility, but not other kinds mm -hmm. of flexibility. So I think yeah. it's, it's those kind of things, you know, in a way, as I said, it's reassuring that you don't have the answers. But I think we also have to be, we have to be careful ourselves about thinking we know what best practice is and what, what long-term improvement in productivity means when you could actually have short, you could be damaging productivity short-term but benefiting uh, in the long term. The only other thing, I, I mean, in terms of what I would like to have more on, I guess I'd like to have a bit more on some of the conflicts and tensions between mm. your um, prescriptions uh, and possibly also where, the, where your advice to companies might be at odds with what you would tell governments. Um, I was struck reading it. You had an example of best practice or innovative practice that um, Amazon has manages its working capital very well, partly by taking money from customers instantly, but not paying suppliers for a month. And you said, uh, if all the top 10 US retailers uh, mm. applied this practice, they would win, I think they'd, they'd save $150 billion in working capital. And I sort of think, well, yes, but that $150 billion is going to come from someone. Oh, yes, it's going to come from those small suppliers. Yeah. And how should I feel about that? if we want to be encouraging the small supplier. So I, some of that I'd like a bit more on. I think more positive, uh, you had a suggestion of the positive ways that governments, that it's not just about cutting costs of government, but actually enabling some of this innovation. And I feel like, again, we're not very good at talking about that. We're very good at pointing out how governments could save money but not necessarily so good on the sort of positive. And actually, if you're reforming government with a goal of improving growth and improving productivity, maybe that's a bit easier than just telling people you're doing it because we haven't got enough money anymore and we need to cut costs. Mm -hmm. um, and finally, I thought maybe if you're talking about the major trends in the world, to have only three... Pay if you look up inequality, I think yeah. it's pages 186 to 9. Three pages seemed like not very much, and you don't seem to, you don't have the answers to that. So well, I guess I'd say you've done yeah. you've done all yeah, of this. You know, you, you've you've summarised all the major trends affecting our world. But what have you done for us lately? I guess would be my question. Well, you know, you inequality is underway. <laughs> Come back. All right, in three so they're going to solve inequality. Yeah. Good. Well, that's okay then. Yeah. But uh, I do. I mean, I think as always, starting with the data is a great uh, place, and that's what I particularly like about this. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you all three for your insights. Um, how about you respond to Stephanie first for a few minutes Should and we then we open the floor to questions? Or we we'll go questions, ahead yeah. with the public. Okay, so please um, tell us your name and affiliation and then the stewards will get Thank to you, you um, with the microphone. So let's start at the back. Yeah, yeah. Hi. <coughs> Sorry, uh, my name's Jake Sumner. Um, I just wanted to get your view on what you see as the importance of the type of country and, and uh, say, democratic regime or not, or otherwise, of driving some of these changes, and also of the nature of the company, which you've tended to view as quite a, a Western view of a, uh, of a company. Um, as opposed to, say, state-owned enterprises in China, which have a different ownership structure. And similarly, you know, China is not a, a democratic uh, country, and so the large cities and all of that, and the growth and all the rest of it, has been done with um, different political structures, which lead to different economic structures or directions. And similarly, in that those type of uh, actors in that, which are the state-owned enterprises. Thank you. Uh, we'll take two more questions and then uh, we'll have Richard and Jonathan reply. Yeah, um, back uh, at the back, yeah. Hi, um, my name is Lola. Um, I'm a master's student here. Um, my question really is about international institutions. So I'm wondering what role do you think international institutions are going to play 
in either facilitating um, this disrupt disruption or um, hindering it. Um, so whether that's the WTO or any other organizations that's being formed in the East. A final question from the back there, yeah. Hello, I'm Gaius Vincent, a documentarist and a very, very decayed economist. Um, I, I, early in your presentation, the McKinsey presentation, talked about uh, urban growth as a cause of increasing prosperity. I wonder if that's correct. Uh, you said not a sufficient, you were implying, I think, not a sufficient cause, but a necessary cause. And you found to just wonder if it couldn't be more of a symptom in that people tend to like um, urban life. And related to that, in your presentation today, and I know I'm trying to be optimistic because that's the way to be a leader and I appreciate that. <laughs> However, <laughs> um, there's no mention of uh, the limitations of the planet. Uh, you know, we all know, we've all heard about at least climate change and the huge growth in population, which we all uh, accept really, does imply that we might come up against agricultural limitations. And I wonder if, if uh, you're uh, not talking about that perhaps is um, connected to this uh, interest in urban growth. And just trying to link that in a haphazard way to Stephanie's last point about, I think you're encouraging, or I think she's saying, you're really encouraging companies to play a zero sum game with late, late payment and early charging. Um, I, I, are you a bit blind when it comes to the quasi-zero-sum game which a limited planet, uh, as particularly agricultural resources, it tends to imply? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, okay, so I'm going to have a go and then Jonathan's going to have a go at some of these. Um, but first of all, the, this environmental thing, we, we have more in the report than I talked about and there was limited time. Um, I, I think it is a huge concern. It's not actually the number, growth in the number of people that is the big factor, it's the growth of the consuming class. The fact is you can add a billion people if they're living in subsistence farming, you know, actually the, 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 the footprint is small. If you take someone from being subsistence farming to living in the city, they're gonna eat meat three times a week rather than just rice, and that's the challenge. So I think there is a huge challenge, there's a challenge on food, water, and particularly when we put the, the, the impact of um, climate change on top, um, we find that the water availability becomes a huge challenge in a lot of areas that were agriculturally okay, suddenly not, but, um, you know, unless we have new irrigation schemes, um, it, it is an issue. So, so I, I agree with that issue. Now, that's the bad news part of the story. The good news is that there's a huge productivity opportunity, particularly in the agricultural sector. Around over 30% of the food that gets picked fails to make it to the shop because it's just the supply chains are not there. Um, when we look at the ability to be more efficient at using water through micro drip irrigation, et cetera, et cetera, when we look at our ability to, to be less wasteful on energy by building our buildings better so that they, are, they have proper insulation, there's a huge prize. So, so we think the challenge on the, the, the environment uh, uh, is gonna be about uh, ma making some of these investments on productivity and also renewables. Um, and, and, and you look at the, some of the technology, that's where technology potentially comes to, to, to bear. Remember that chart I started with? We had a 20-fold increase in GDP uh, during the last century, but we were able to actually halve commodity prices because productivity of getting resources out of the ground and to the end consumer actually went faster than our growth in GDP. And I think when we add renewables, when we add some of the, the, the ability to, to build things better and to run supply chains and modern agricultural techniques, et cetera, et cetera, I think that we can actually offset this. And I, I don't think that we're destined for, for, for a crisis on this. I think the challenge is whether we move fast enough early enough. So, you know, G7 today announced they want to get rid of fossil fuels by the end of the century. I mean, that's great. It's not moving fast <laughs> enough today in terms of some of this thing. And the risk is that we go through a series of very big price, price spikes, and it's only by having these very big price spikes do we get the movement. You want to? Sure. Yeah, I mean, there are a few others in yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll come I, to the company if you want me to. Well, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, um, in no particular order, international institutions, um, the, uh, 
the post Bretton Woods institutions were established at a time when most communications was, and travel was done by ship. <laughs> and this is reflected in their governance structures. Uh, so it is uh, quite likely that there will be reform. <laughs> and uh, I think there is a quest for relevance in the part of many of them in the current pace of disruption, uh, hastened by the emergence of new multilateral institutions uh, endeavoring to take up the slack, uh, whether it's the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, note Infrastructure Investment, not Development Bank, <laughs> uh, or the BRICS Bank or what have you. So and I think there's a general sense that the multilateral context is evolving quickly, much quicker than it has for the last 50 years, and that we will see with that uh, an important role uh, to catch up and to provide the benefits that multilateral cooperation can provide, whether it's capital or technology or, or, or simply help. Um, on the urbanization, I, I think it's an interesting question, and this is what I do, so uh, ex uh, permit me for a moment. I mean, we, I think when I look about our disruptive trends, I think that these are fundamental characteristics of human beings. Uh, the, you know, we, we seem to be the species that build cities. <laughs> it's just a thing that we do. Uh, and there is no recorded instance in human history uh, of de-urbanization on a, on a sustained scale, plague, war, and famine not responding. It is, in fact, really hard to kill a city. Uh, the Mayan, you know, we bomb them, we drop nuclear weapons on them, we, we have plagues, and they still come back. And uh, we, we, you know, the, the Pol Pot tried. The, it, uh, it, is a, it is an interesting and ultimately perhaps unknowable question as to why we do this, but it is, it is, seems to be a characteristics of the, of, of the human race, along with the urge to invent, the urge to trade, and the undeniable reality of aging. Uh, these are fundamental characteristics of who we are. Um, so do we, we are lucky that it seems to generate wealth. It's, it, it seems to create a value. And that, how does it do that? Well, essentially, it forces us to make choices uh, over and over again rapidly. And we become more resilient because of the choices we make. Uh, and they're not always good choices, but we see the consequences of them. And I think that is how urbanization works. So it's, uh, it is a net a positive story. And uh, we, in fact, note some very interesting facts. Did you know that, for example, as we grow older, as we go heavier, we, of course, move slower. That is a biological law. But if when we are in a city, as a city grows bigger, in fact, it becomes faster. Walking speeds go up. And that is why people in London do walk faster than people in the village. It, uh, it, it seems to be interesting. It's an interesting reality that uh, cities encourage and raise our metabolic rate. So are there limits to this? No doubt. And occasionally we, we discover them, notably when we have storms, uh, or uh, perhaps when we, uh, when we encounter a shortage of something. That is, an, that is a cause for concern, but it's also a cause for invention. And again, where do we see innovation? And where do we see innov invention? Uh, there are clear relationships between technology and density and proximity effects. Uh, so that is, you know, again, perhaps you know, this is a necessary part of our process of, uh, of learning and development, but urbanization seems to be intimately tied uh, to the progress of the species. Uh, finally, we don't have, I think, a point of view on the merits of democracy at this point, uh, Richard, do we? No. <laughs> I don't think so. I, we haven't quantified that yet, but... Uh. Let's <laughs> take any more, I, any I, more I, questions. Actually, there, was, there was one question just on, on the corporate, and maybe you had a comment as well, do you want to make? Um, just on the corporates, we are, we're actually trying to do some research at the moment looking at the changing nature of corporations. I think the emerging market corporation has typically Two, two types of corporations that have, I think, a source of advantage over the Western one is the state-owned enterprise, but it's also the family-controlled business. And when we look at both of those, you know, and, and, and I worked with a lot of families when I lived in South Korea, and you would ask them what they thought their biggest source of advantage over their American competitors. And they would say, you know, we as a family are here for 20 years or 50 years, and we have that duration in our thinking but we're also not worrying about next quarter's earnings. And they really felt that was a huge advantage. And you look at the returns that these businesses are prepared to make in the short term to build uh, long term, it is quite striking. You know, Samsung's um, semiconductor business lost money for 20 years. They're now the, the largest men memory manufacturer in the world. But they were prepared to invest on that. I don't think I know many Western executives could get away with that. 
have I a guess, question? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, no, I just, I mean, the, the problem with this, of course, is that you can also, it's a very um, uh, time specific judgment because 10 or 20 years ago, you would have looked at those same companies, and in fact, we did. Yeah. You know, when I was at the US Treasury, one of the things we did was try and prevent South Korea from defaulting in the Asian yeah. financial crisis. And there, that was precisely that they'd been, they had, lost they had this yeah. awful yeah. loss making family companies that had been propped up by uh, inefficient government policy and implicit yeah. guarantees yeah. Yeah. and everything else. So I want to, you know, it wouldn't necessarily say it was a recipe for success that uh, you can lose money for decades and then eventually make money. Yeah. You know. We have two questions. Uh, here, Hi, can you hear me? I'm Amanda Satilli, author of The Agility Advantage, How to Identify and Act on Opportunities in a Fast-Changing World. I'm really interested in your third point here about optimism. The first two points seem obvious enough, but optimism is a really interesting choice for your third recommendation. So I'm interested in why you picked it and if you've had put any thought into how to be optimistic, besides just saying, wow, everything's changing so fast, somehow I'm gonna take advantage of this, um, are there any other uh, interesting concepts that you come up with around optimism? We have a question here in the, in the middle, uh, seventh row. Huh. I'm David Wood from London Futurists. I wanted to ask you about a trend which I thought would be present, but you seem not to be looking much at it, which is the trend of technological unemployment. After all, you do look to what may happen to the workforce and what may happen to productivity, and you're basically assuming that the, most people will still have jobs uh, provided they're fit and healthy enough, whereas there seems to be uh, many projections that as robots uh, have better compute computer vision, as they have better uh, data analysis, they're going to increasingly do many, many more jobs than they've done presently. So isn't this actually a, a bigger trend and it might have a big impact on productivity as well, because robots could be much more productive than sure. we humans. But then there's a the big question, well, what are we all going to do and how are we all going to be paid if we don't have uh, work? Yeah. Uh, second row here. Ivana um, Kutoswa, CNN. Um, I'm I like how you described the four disruptions, but I'd be interested in your predictions on the next big disruption. What do you see as, uh, I know it's a tricky one, you look into your crystal ball and tell me what, what is the next one to expect. Thanks. Uh, one, one example on the optimism thing. Um, a lot of corporations sit there and they have the potential to new, launch new business. And they sit there and say, well, we don't want to launch that new business because it's going to cannibalize our existing business. I think that, that is the, the, the myth of cannibalization is probably destroyed more value than practically any other thing in the corporate world. Because what then happens is the corporation doesn't launch the new product, their competitor does, and their business gets destroyed. So I think you know, if we talk about optimism, it's actually the, 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 the mindset at the corporate level of, I could actually succeed at something new. And I think that would be the, the, the bit that I would encourage and for management teams, those of management teams here, stop having the discussion of cannibalization because if you don't do it, someone else is going to do it uh, in terms of that. I think this issue on technology unemployment is very real, um, but it's not new. The monks that used to write the Bibles out by hand had their jobs disappeared um, because of the printing press. The uh, typing pools that any of you went into an office 30 or 40 years ago used to exist, or any of you who are too young to that see on Mad Men, whatever, you can you know, see those typing pools. Those, didn't those don't exist now. There aren't a lot of unemployed monks around in the world saying, you know, we're not, there aren't a lot of unemployed typists. They have got redeployed. So, you know, we have successfully done that. Um, so there is a chance that we can do that. I think the risk is that it's going to happen at too quick a pace. We certainly have to do it in our lives now. The difference is the monks who were replaced, the next generation of monks were trained up to do something else, what sell pardons or whatever they, they went on to do. But you know, they had their different version in terms of what they were doing. So they were able to, to do something different. We have to do this in our life and that is a challenge. And part of that is how we teach people on agility to be able to be redeployed in terms of doing that. And there is you know, always the scenario that we may be able to take a bit more leisure. 
And actually, we've already done that. If you look at working hours, those have been in decline. We are taking a bit more leisure uh, because technology is replacing some of the jobs. So, you know, the question is, can we get people redeployed into activities that require people? And obviously, you know, the demographics help because we actually have fewer workers, so we, we, that may, may help in the situation. Uh, the question is whether we can see that all come together. Yeah, and I actually wanted to build on something that Stephanie had said before, which actually I, I found quite interesting, this uh, why must productivity be lower? I, I, I actually see, we see the reverse when we looked at the growth in productivity, that there is far more potential for productivity than we have taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. and, it's and most of that simply comes by, yes, catching up, <laughs> so helping the Chinese auto industry consolidate that much faster to become more productive. So, that the opportunity is there, but what it implies is a rate of change perhaps double than what we've had before. And so a rate of technological unemployment perhaps higher, double what we've had before. So there is a question of does the center hold? And uh, that, that may be the issue, sort of like how do we get comfortable as, a, as, a, as an urban world with this higher and more, more faster rate of productivity, which is, and, and a question, do we want it? Maybe we should be better off with a lower rate of growth and, and where are the consequences with our, in our benefits. I think that is a question of governance and a conversation. But you know, why be an optimist? Well, because there doesn't seem to be much point in being anything else. Uh, I believe that was Winston. Uh, so uh, I think there is, a, there is an opportunity here. It is a more, more about how we as a collection of societies and individuals choose to take advantage of it, wearing, bearing in mind the important questions of unemployment. And to that point, yes, clearly people are talking about negative income taxes as ways of you know, offsetting some of the issues related to technological employment, structural changes, um, negative interest rate funds. So you know, there, there's, there, there is going to be a longer conversation about that. And as to the next disruption, as I said, well, uh, the, uh, I, I, I don't, we, we, we will come back to you on that. We'd love to have your ideas, <laughs> actually, what you see uh, from, from the global perspective. <laughs> We have time to, for three more short questions. So one here, one, one there in the back, and one at the top, yeah. Hello, my name is Johnny from Royal College of Art, Service Design. And uh, thank you for sharing the insight. The recommendation you gave us at the end of the presentation seems very similar to the discussion around design and design thinking. I'm just wondering, and we have seen various uh, impact from design on private sector and public sector, i.e. policy making and government transformation. I'm very interested to hear some of your views on design and its impact on organization and its transformation. Thank you. Ben Barry, I work at the International Institute for Strategic Studies. It seems to me there's a dark side to each of these individually and in aggregate. For example, urbanization and increased connectivity enables the have-nots to see much more of what the, ha the haves are. Urbanization can produce places like Harrogate, Cheltenham or Vancouver. It can also produce places like Karachi and Kabul. And um, you seem to ignore geopolitics and particularly resource competition I mean, take the South China Sea, enormous friction there, which isn't unconnected to the fact a million people make their living, millions more depend on its products, and competing um, energy prospecting. And the last question in the back. Hi, my name's Christine, and I'm a former LSE student, um, now at the Bank of England. Um, my question is about inequality, because at the LSE recently, the new International Inequalities Institute was opened, and there's been Stiglitz, Atkinson, and Piketty here last couple of weeks to talk about why inequality is such a disruptive force or will be such a disruptive force. Um, and maybe it's because your book and the presentation is geared towards a certain audience for, or for a certain purpose, but I would like to know why you don't see this as a force that could kind of even have either an intermediary or a competing effect on these four forces that you mention. Shall I start with the inequality? Um, First of all, I did put a chart up there that showed rising inequality for the male U.S. worker as an illustration. You know, technology had meant that the skilled worker got an increasing salary. The, the, the unskilled were being replaced by trade, labor, um, la 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 migration, and, and technology replacing it. So I completely agree this is an issue. 
However, globally, inequality isn't going up. Think about it. Inequality actually is falling globally because we're taking a billion people out of poverty. Within a country, inequality is going up, but globally, we are actually seeing falling inequality. But I think we actually face an even bigger issue, and we're trying to do some work on this at the moment, and you know, we'd love you, anyone that's here to come and help us on this. And that's this issue about, in some ways, inequality matters a bit, but there is something that we think is going to be much more politically challenging, and that's intergenerational inequality. If I'm 10% better, and someone in Canary Wharf is 30% better, you know, I'm going to be relatively happy. You know, if I'm 10% better than my parents' generation and someone else is 30%, but I'm going to mind it a lot less. You obviously don't work in Canary Wharf. No. <laughs> I don't know, no, no. But if you're in a situation where a generation is going to be worse off than the previous generation, we're going to have a real problem. And the trouble is we are now getting to the point where that's beginning to happen. Up to now, you've been able to tell everyone, you know, the system works for you. The system works, the system being immigration, Brussels, trade, globalization. Because you're getting, everyone is getting better off in the developed world. The problem is we're now reaching a point where that's no longer the case. And there's a group of people, and depending on your labor structure, labor market, it may be the old, older people in countries like the UK, it may be the young in countries like France and, German, uh, France and um, Italy. And that group is then going to say, we are no longer better off than the previous generation. And I think that's the inequality problem we really need to be focusing on and how we address that. And that's what we're trying to size at the moment. And we built a database with Stephanie's point about data. We have 2,000 segments, and we're looking at how those segments have gone up and down over time. And we're trying to understand which are the segments that are really at risk of growing up worse off, and what are the measures required to actually address that at a micro level. But I agree, it is a, it's a major consequence. I think it's actually inequality, the fall in inequality and the rise in inequality actually are the result of these four disruptions. Yes, I, I, certainly, so, so I think that's exactly right, that this is an outcome. Uh, and it's an outcome, uh, in some ways, I think it links maybe to the question around design. Uh, good design is more important than ever. <laughs> and design, by good design, design that incorporates externalities, uh, be they environmental or social or economic. And an externality, simply put, is a consequence that was not intended, a negative one. So if we are encouraging making economic decisions based on an incomplete understanding of the consequences, we are going to wear, the, wear those consequences. And I think you're fair to point out this issue around the receivables man and supplier management. That would be an example of a decision made in a system which is not recognizing that externality and will ultimately wear it in the form of declining health in those communities. So good design is really important when systems are at the point of change. Uh, and we see systems changing faster and faster. So design is that much more important and thinking that through is a great task and an obligation and an opportunity. Um, and we're glad we're doing this at LSE today. And I do hope that this is incorporated in the curriculum. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, the urban geopolitics one would be, again, I think kind of linked to that, is that's the outcome of bad design. <laughs> uh, the des design of, uh, of sort of dispute resolution mechanisms which have simply outlived their usefulness. Uh, again, the post Bretton Woods institutions are due for a, due, due for a long overdue uh, rehaul and sort of way of thinking about how to establish this communication and this better set of partnerships. So we'll see. If that doesn't happen, then we will have disruption. Uh, we will have disruption within our cities, within our countries, and within our, within our regions. And of course, that is not a view of the world that any of us would be better off in. Imagine a world with a bad U.S.-China relationship. <laughs> Imagine a world that there, where there is actual harm in that relationship. That's not a good world. <laughs> uh, we, we need to find a way of avoiding that and making it a better world. Uh, just one other thought on this geopolitics point. Um, I, I'm not sure geopolitics has necessarily gone up. I mean, remember, we had the Cuban Missile Crisis. We had a period maybe of less geopolitics. You know, we've been throwing geopolitical shocks at the world. The difference now is because we're so interconnected, we see the impact of more of them. And I think that there is a substantial risk of this, but I think we could also end up in a mutually assured destruction world on geopolitics. Uh, as an example, you know, people are pissed off that the Russians have done something in Ukraine. So we put sanctions on, but we haven't done real sanctions. Real sanctions would be switching off the SWIFT system for the Russians, so their, their banking system no longer works. You know, 
it would be stopping buying Russian gas. You know, we've done level three sanctions because we're in a mutually assured destruction world that if we switched off SWIFT, suddenly a hacker would take down the US power system and that the Americans don't want that to happen. And so we're in a world where we end up with that. So I think there is a, at least a chance because of this connectivity, we can find a way of dealing with the geopolitics. The, the connectivity can spread the impact of geopolitics. So a small geopolitical sho shock or, or a natural disaster too actually becomes a much bigger effect. But they can also provide a, a way of evening it out, producing this mutually assured destruction world in terms of some of that. And the question is whether we're going to end up in that world or whether we're going to end up in the, the dark world you talked about. I, I can't help, just from the way you've just described it, of course, makes me think of The Grand Illusion. I mean, the book that was written in 1913 that said it made exactly that yeah. argument that we couldn't possibly have another war because we were all so interconnected. So, of course, we yeah. need to be careful. <laughs> um, no, and it's a genuine, I mean, it's a real thing. I mean, uh, I do think it's interesting the way that political economy is sort of creeping into lots of different bits of this conversation, you know, and I mentioned I thought we needed more on inequality and it was yeah. mentioned again. Yeah. I mean, I've, I, I've often spout, or well, make the point, about into overall global equality going down, going up, even as we've had rising inequality within countries. And I actually put that to Joe Stiglitz in a sort yeah. of similar event. Said, well, wouldn't we still look back on this as a period of, of falling inequality? And he, made, he just made the point, well, that's true, but we don't live in the world, we live in countries. And within every country, whether it's India or yeah. Britain or America, inequality has been going up. And if we think some of the economic costs of inequality are actually costs that come from, the come from within country inequality, and we don't really comfort ourselves very much with the knowledge that there are now a lot fewer yeah. poor yeah. people in China, um, then these issues are quite important. Okay, okay. And I'm not sure I would even comfort myself, if it is comfort, that it's generational inequality rather than something that sounds a bit more Marxist and a bit more class-driven, because we know how the generational... You know, inequality can be generational in another sense, uh, in the sense that it's passed down. You know, older, older people, these baby boomers, are actually not very good at making sure they have no money when they die. Um, so they will tend to pass it on to the next generation and those students that look very poor, actually some of them will turn out to be not very poor yeah. because they'll inherit a house and you know, all those things. Yeah. So I think, and it makes a huge difference to whether you can pass some of these, whether you can do these difficult things to get your productivity growth. Um, you mention in the book that uh, most of the gains, most of the productivity growth has gone to the higher skilled and the higher income people. Um, as long as that continues to be the case, if the, if the higher income people are capturing the gains of productivity growth, you're not going to be able to persuade everyone else to do all this stuff. Yeah. So I think that you know, the political economy yeah, ends up I being at the heart of it. I sound like Piketty. I didn't expect to sound like Piketty. <laughs> <laughs> he still needs a lesson in good data from you, though. So. <laughs> oh, and the other, but I do, I do agree with the optimism. And what was it that the other, the other great phrase on this is that we have to be optimistic because pessimism is for easier times. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. On that note, let me thank Richard, Jonathan, and Stephanie for a fascinating talk and insight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.